Brain control. It sucks. But what is it? It's basically a policy that limits the amount of rent that a landlord can charge to renters to live in their property. Its obvious intention is to protect low-income renters from unaffordable prices. But what people don't take into account is that rent control discourages and even lowers the supply of rental housing. And we know from basic economics that if we lower the supply of something, we also increase the price. In spite of this, rent control is quite a popular policy and has even been getting traction in American presidential campaigns. When in 2020 presidential candidate Bernie Sanders' Housing for All agenda, rent control was one of the proposed policies. Yes, Starin. Rent control measures were part of my Housing for All initiative, along with other major policies such as investing $2.5 trillion to build nearly 10 million permanently affordable housing units, making Section 8 vouchers available for families, ending homelessness and revitalize public housing by investing $70 billion to repair, decarbonize, and build new public housing. Frankly, we have an affordable housing crisis. I mean, in America, over 10 million families are paying more than 50% of their income on housing, yet Wall Street makes record profits. America has a shortage of 7.4 million affordable homes for the lowest income renters. If I were elected president back in 2020, I would have enacted a national cap on annual rent increases at no more than 3% or 1.5% the consumer price index, whichever is higher to prevent the exploitation of tenants at the hands of private landlords. This rent control is necessary as rents are skyrocketing and large housing markets such as New York and San Francisco as well as rural areas. It's interesting that you talk about housing shortages and San Francisco, Mr. Sanders, since I have not one but two studies detailing the effects of a certain rent control policy in the aforementioned city. Rent control is popular in the San Francisco Bay Area, with seven cities having imposed rent control regulations, but there is a lack of detail and natural experiments regarding rent control and its effects. But according to my first study, landlords responded to rent control by substituting their properties to other types of real estate like converting to condos and redeveloping buildings to be exempt from rent control. But before we get into the study, how did we first get rent control in San Francisco? In 1979, Mayor Dianne Feinstein signed San Francisco's first rent control law. Yes, that Dianne Feinstein. Nationally high inflation rates was a key motivation for such a policy and this law capped annual rent increases to 7% and covered all rental units built before 1979. But there was an exemption and that was owner occupied buildings containing 4 units or less. This was due to a perception that these so called mom and pop households were less profit driven than the much bigger corporate heartless landlords and had more in common with your average tenant. These smaller exempt rental units made up 44% of the rental housing stock in 1990, so it was a pretty large exemption to the rent control policy. However, these smaller units were purchased by large businesses who would then sell a small share of the building to a live-in owner to satisfy the rent control exemption. So much for decency and wholesomeness of mum and pop landlords. Anyway, the city caught wind of this and enacted a new initiative in 1994 to remove the small multifamily rent control exemption of 4 units or less. After the 1994 referendum, the number of units subject to rent control in San Francisco rose by roughly 68% for the average zip code. Not to mention that as of 2015, about 60% of San Francisco's rental stock is rent control. That's basically 40% of the overall housing stock. The reason it's so large is because a significant amount of the rental units were built before 1979, so we have quite a significant sample size to work with here. And this is where we have the perfect conditions for a decent comparison in rent control. By looking at the effects of the removal of the rent control exemption for these small buildings post-1994, the study defines two groups, the treatment group and the control group. The treatment group are renters who live in small apartment buildings built before 1980 basically the ones who have rent control protections. The control group are renters who live in small multifamily housing built between 1980 and 1990, the ones without rent control. Now, there are obvious advantages to rent control. Tenants who benefit from rent control are 10 to 20% more likely to remain at their address in 1994 compared to the control group. 
These effects are stronger for older households as well as households that spend many years at their address. This makes sense since these types of groups are generally less mobile. Not to mention that during 2000 to 2004, the rent control group were 3.54% more likely to live in the same address, which is a 19.38% increase relative to the control group. Rent control seems to have also made people more likely to stay in San Francisco, as the rent controlled group were 4.51% more likely to stay in San Francisco from 2000 to 2004. In addition, each tenant did receive between $2,300 and $6,600 per year from rent control between 1995 and 2012, and the total benefits annually are estimated between $214 million and the present discounted value of $2.9 billion. Nevertheless, for tenants who have only lived a few years at their address, the impact of rent control can be negative. The impact is only negative in census tracts with the highest rise in rent prices, implying that landlords actively remove tenants in areas where the reward is highest for recessing to market rents. But these benefits are counterbalanced by landlords, reducing supply in response to rent control. The study concludes that the citywide rent rose by 5.1%. This has a present discounted cost of $2.9 billion to tenants. 42% of these losses are paid by future San Francisco residents, while current residents will bear the other 58% of the losses. Within the control group, there are 15% less renters living in these buildings and 25% less renters living in rent controlled buildings compared to 1994. This disparity is attributable to landlords demolishing their old housing and build new rental housing since new construction is exempt from rent control. Renters living in a parcel decreased by 20% compared to between 1990 and 1994, but the number of renters living in rent control departments decreased by almost 30% in the late 2000s. The exodus of tenants leaving rent control units is much larger than the overall decline in renters as a number of rent control buildings were redeveloped. And these redevelopment activities can be tearing down the existing structure and putting up new single family buildings, condominium, multifamily housing, or simply converting them to condos. These redeveloped buildings replace 10% of the older rental stock subject to rent control. You may ask, whether this redevelopment activity actually occurred with non-rent control groups. Well, rent control buildings were 8% more likely to convert to a condo or a tenancy in common than buildings in the control group. This represents a substantial reduction in the supply of rental housing. And if you are still somehow skeptical, landlords of rent controlled units disproportionately took out additional permits such as renovation and conversions of multifamily housing to condos, which require such permits due to significant changes to the property. Anyway, this leads to the main point, where all of this accumulated to a 6% decrease in housing supply, which led to the 5.1% rise in rental prices that I talked about before. Of course, a limitation to the study is that it excludes renters in buildings constructed after 1990, since individuals who live in new construction may be a selected sample, as well as tenants who moved before 1980. While this 2019 paper shows how landlords respond to rent control by exiting the rental market, another paper shows how landlords respond to rent control by still remaining in the rental market, and through a little thing called evictions. But before I move on to this point, if you are enjoying the video so far or like some of the arguments being presented here, please give a like as it will really help my video in the YouTube algorithm. Vacancy decontrol provisions allow landlords to reset rents to market rates when tenants move. While these policies reduce the returns of landlords rent, it also creates incentive to increase tenant turnover by either tenants moving from their rental properties or through evictions. This is because the more often that a tenant moves, the more often that a landlord can raise rents to market rates. In San Francisco, under the rent ordinance, unless the tenant is in breach of the lease in some way, you as a landlord can only legally evict a tenant in one of three ways. Either the landlord or a family member occupies the rental unit after the tenant leaves, they remove all rental units from the rental market under the Ellis Act, or they demolish the rental unit. But move-in evictions are less financially beneficial since the rents would be raised on the landlord or family member who moved in. Also, if they relet the unit before three years has passed, then the rent control regulations forbid them from raising the rent above the previous rent price. 
Nevertheless, landlords can evade these laws quite easily. This is because the rent board only audits 10% of units each year and trying to ensure that the landlords are charging the correct rent. And even if the landlord is discovered to be charging above the rent control price, they would pay a fine of up to $1,000 for each month they charge above the legal rent limit. There are many ways to legally evict someone, but the landlord won't be able to immediately reset their rent to market rates. But wrongful evictions can allow landlords to change and charge market prices. So it's no surprise that a sharp rise in claims of wrongful evictions is observed. But not only that, a sharp rise in eviction notices was also observed from 1995 when rent control was expanded. This rise in eviction notices are concentrated in evictions that are most related to owner moving evictions and Ellis Act evictions, and these two evictions are linked to rent control based incentives. Especially since evictions don't increase unless market rents exceed the allowed increase in rental places, which are great incentives for landlords to evict. And if you think these evictions have nothing to do with rent control, then you are most likely wrong since there are no large rises in evictions that landlords cannot directly control, such as non-payment. But no-fault evictions, which landlords do control, rise, and these no-fault evictions may be wrongfully handled slash submitted by landlords. The largest effects were in years where rent control was particularly binding. Both wrongful eviction claims and eviction notices only rise in zip codes with higher levels of exposure to rent control. The effect increases over time, which is consistent with increasing incentives to evict. In fact, for every 1,000 additional new rent control departments, there was 20.07 additional eviction notices filed in a zip code, and an additional 7,632 wrongful eviction claims, as there were about 1,688 newly rent controlled units in each zip code, on average. These effects mean eviction notices filed with the rent board rose by 83% and the number of wrongful eviction claims rose by 125% for zip codes with the average level of exposure to rent control. Uh, not to mention that in 1994, there was a 0.7% eviction rate for rent control units, but after 1998, there was a 1.7% eviction rate. This is more than double the eviction rate in 1994 before the rent control expansion. Of course, the authors themselves said there could be limitations to the validity of these results, since the policy only affected the small, so-called mom-and-pop landlords. I forgot to mention, but the authors of the first study talking about cussing housing supply did argue that social insurance against rent increases could instead be provided, such as through a subsidy or tax credit, to insure renters against large rent increases. That would be an interesting policy to analyse and talk about, but will have to be for another day. But, but you just hate the poor. As I said, America has a shortage of 7.4 million affordable homes for the lowest income renters. Funny you say that, because landlord evictions that rent control causes hurt the working class and working areas. Landlords may less likely evict someone who will start a fight. Instead, they may be more likely to evict lower income tenants, since they may assume that these tenants are less likely to pursue a legal response due to a lack of resources, among other factors. Low income zip codes are significantly more hurt when it comes to evictions. Estimated effects for low income zip codes are at least 60% higher than in high income zip codes. Low income zip codes has 9 more eviction notices per 1000 than high income zip codes which represents estimated effects that are 63% higher. Similarly, the estimated effect for wrongful eviction notices is 160% higher in low income zip codes than high income zip codes. If you really want to help the lowest income renters, rent control isn't the way to go. Uh, no, no, you're just cucking for the rich, especially when they gentrify properties, leading to wealthy and exclusionary neighborhoods that prevent new development. This forces gentrification and displacement in low income and minority areas. There's even one policy we have where we can provide grants to states, cities, and whatevers to create their own community trusts that allow households to purchase a shared equity home that will remain affordable after they leave, which combats gentrification as it can allow families to stay in the neighborhoods they lived in for decades. You're accusing me of cucking to the rich through gentrification. Now that is rich, especially since this rent control policy likely fueled gentrification of San Francisco as the properties like newly built condos cater to higher income individuals this causes a higher level of income inequality in the city overall. And why do I believe this? 
because the Treaty Group ultimately live in census tracts that have lower house prices, lower median incomes, lower college shares, and higher unemployment rates than the Control Group. If individuals of this Treaty Group had remained at their 1993 address, then they would have lived in census tracts with significantly higher college shares, higher house prices, lower unemployment rates, and no effect on household income than the Control Group. But the rent control tenants left very selected neighborhoods, rather than equally leaving across all locations in San Francisco. This provides evidence that landlords did undertake efforts to remove their tenants or convince them to leave in improving, gentrifying areas. And another key point when it comes to gentrification is owners versus renters. Owners of homes are generally richer than renters since they usually have to make a massive down payment and need funds to sustain a long-term investment in their property, while renters don't. And in San Francisco, the number of owners rose by 10% in the late 2000s compared to the period of 1990 to 1994. So San Francisco has wealthier residents. As we talked about before with the redevelopment, new property investment, demolition of buildings, new buildings being constructed, greater conversion to owner-occupied housing, and the fall in renters. All of this leads to a housing stock that caters to higher income individuals. So yeah, it's basically quite likely that rent control fueled the gentrification of San Francisco. You, you smelly brown autist. Go back to where you came from and stop taking jobs from poor British workers since I think there is a limited number of jobs so I believe in the fix pie fallacy. My goodness, your bigotry knows no bounds. It is no wonder you had a Nazi flag in one of your rallies. You truly are a national socialist. Actually, the Nazis weren't socialists, but right-wing politicians who attempted to appeal to progressive populations uh, using this name in propaganda, such as... Oh, shut up, centrist. This is my video. Anyways, overall rent control failed in San Francisco due to landlords converting rental units to properties like condos, which pushed renters out and cut housing supply by 6%, which led to a citywide increase in rent prices by 5.1%. This contributed to gentrification since the new converted buildings catered to high income groups and occupants under rent control disproportionately received higher wrongful evictions and eviction notices than those not under rent control. And this eviction effect itself disproportionately hurt the poor. Before I wrap up, I want to say thanks to an amazing friend of mine from Twitter, Layman, who voiced Bernie Sanders and is a political centrist. Hey Theron, I'm happy to be in this video to voice Bernie Sanders, and uh, as Theron said, my name is Layman, and uh, housing has been a pretty important issue for me, being a Canadian and all, and I often talk about it a lot on uh, various different platforms. Uh, you can catch me on Twitter and YouTube, if you just search Layman. Uh, and uh, in fact, I just recently streamed about the, the Canadian housing crisis, so you can go on my channel to check that out under my, uh, my stream VODs. You can hear me rant about that for three hours, hear all my solutions and everything. Um, it's, uh, it's one of the issues that uh, I definitely think <laughs> um, we need a lot more uh, market involvement in. I think it's probably the best case for a free market economy, and uh, I'm often uh, adverse to stuff like, like zoning regulations and spacing regulations, and I go over all of it in the video. Anyway, you can follow me on Twitter, YouTube channel, and uh, yeah, thank you very much. And they're also, you can also catch it in the pinned comments too. Thank you again, Layman. Again, if you enjoyed my video, please give a like as well as comment since it will boost my video in the algorithm. And also subscribe since I post similar econ and political content responding to socialists and their ideas. In terms of dealing with their concerns, such as price rises for poor renters, I think our aim should be increasing the supply of houses via deregulation of housing, such as zoning laws leading to a fall in overall prices, but that is probably a video for another day. Anyways, thanks for watching and see you guys later.